Okay, uh, we'll restart the session now. Uh, Eli Kovitz from Ben Gurion University of the Negev uh, in Israel he has uh, will be giving his second lecture on the primordial black hole dark matter. Um, just a couple of uh, comments about uh, as we go along. These are pedagogical talks. These are talks where we're all trying to learn and understand. So clearly, there are going to be questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and mark it to everyone. Don't mark it to me specifically or to the speaker. Just mark it to everyone. I'm requesting uh, Eli to maybe after about 15, 20 minutes at some appropriate time, take a brief halt. We'll take some of the questions, maybe not all. Maybe if there is time, you can do another such break, depending, uh, Eli, on where you think things can, where you can naturally stop. And then we'll, of course, take questions at the very end as well. If for some reason we're unable to answer all the questions during the session, uh, the session will end at around 1.10. Uh, we will, uh, uh, I request Eli to answer some of those questions later in the day, and we'll um, send you a text message, or, you know, we'll send you those answers in text form uh, later on, maybe over in a day or so. Okay. So Eli, uh, over to you. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about indirect detection now, and then uh, for about half of the time, and then uh, direct detection in the other half. Um, so let's start um, with the indirect detection. And I've given some introduction of, uh, for gravitational waves and the LIGO detector. Uh, and now the critical question, if we want to discuss gravitational waves coming from the um, coalescence and merger of primordial black holes, is how the binaries form. So for that, we have two basic models that we, that we that have been considered in the literature. One is that they become bound early on. So you have some initial configuration of primordial black holes, some random uh, uh, um, um, setup of primordial black holes that have been formed. And then um, basically each black hole has its closest partner. Uh, and once the universe become, uh, becomes matter dominated, these, these two black holes start uh, approaching one another. Now there is an influence from the other black holes around. So they don't uh, uh, plunge directly toward each other, but there's a disturbance. So they find each other in very eccentric orbits. And because their orbits are eccentric, they also merge um, um, not after uh, too long a time. These are quite numerous because if, you, if these binaries account, if these black holes account for all of dark matter, then all the black, all the black holes have a binary partner uh, in a sense, uh, and if and some of them, and, and, and then there's a distribution of separations between uh, the binaries, and a lot of them can have a separation that then uh, causes them to merge within a Hubble time, again, because of this eccentricity. There's a wide distribution of merger times, um, and the question is whether the total merger rate can explain the LIGO rate or not. Uh, in a paper led by uh, Yassin, and he's going to talk about that in his talk, uh, we, found, we found that certainly, yes, uh, the merger rate, uh, consistent with the uh, findings of uh, the original group who, who suggested this, uh, the total merger rate can explain LIGO, can explain the LIGO rate even beyond it. So even just a fraction of 1% um, or even below uh, of the total dark matter in the form of these uh, primordial black holes can explain the LIGO rate. Um, however, there's, there was this question of whether these binaries survive um, uh, all the way until they merge. Um, so from the moment that they become bound and they find themselves in an inspiraling uh, orbit, whether they become, um, whether they are disrupted by interaction with the third primordial black hole, interaction between uh, the black holes in the environment, if they, if they don't constitute all of dark matter, interaction with the rest of dark matter, et cetera, et cetera. A recent paper by Karsten Jadamsik found that uh, they actually do not survive, or um, at least what happens is that there's a third binary that keeps coming in and, it, and the binaries are, are exchanged. And as they are exchanged, the orbit also becomes more circular and they never, mer they never merge in time. Um, he's going to talk about that uh, more this week as well. Another um, mechanism for generating binaries is that uh, is two body capture. Basically you have one primordial black hole traveling close to another primordial black hole. As it comes close, uh, there's a time dependent quadrupole moment, gravitational waves are emitted. And if the energy loss to gravitational waves is larger than the kinetic energy of the system, then the pair becomes bound. Uh, 
So for low relative velocity environments where the relative velocity is low, where the velocity dispersion of these primordial black holes is low, uh, and if the initial separation, if, and if the um, impact parameter is small, then this can be an efficient mechanism. Um, two body capture is a much rarer process because indeed the relative velocity has to be low and the impact parameter has to be low. The cross section uh, depends on the velocity with this uh, interesting power law. Um, however, the, the merger time is extremely short because as you see by definition almost, the orbit is extremely eccentric. And then the merger time is very quick. We'll go through that in, in a few slides. Uh, and basically the, the binaries merge within uh, minutes to, to uh, hundreds of years. Um, they predominantly form in low mass halos because in low mass halos, the velocity dispersion is smaller. And then there's the question whether the total merger rate is consistent with the LIGO rate. In our paper, uh, we found that it isn't. It isn't quite enough to explain uh, the LIGO rate, but again, this has been reviewed and there are suggestions that uh, perhaps it might explain. So we'll hear more uh, from the relevant people uh, uh, this week. Okay, uh, so this is just a shout out to Yassine Stock and Karsten Stocks uh, uh, later this week. All right, but now the question is whether or not uh, the rate works out. The question is, let's assume that it does work out. Uh, the question is whether PBH dark matter has testable gravitational wave predictions, whether you can distinguish between gravitational waves that have come from uh, stellar black holes and ones that come from primordial black holes. And the answer is a definite yes. So let's go through the, test the list of testable predictions for gravitational waves coming from the merger of primordial black holes. One regards electromagnetic counterparts. We expect these uh, primordial black holes to, uh, to not necessarily have any um, accretion disks because uh, there's nothing um, uh, to accrete from, especially for the second mechanism where uh, these primordial black holes are formed, uh, the binaries are formed in uh, low mass halos where there is no uh, baryonic matter. So this is unlikely. And indeed, none have been found so far. So we have dozens of uh, black hole mergers now detected by LIGO, and none of them have uh, an electric, electromagnetic counterpart detected. The mass spectrum. The mass spectrum would generically be different from stellar black holes. So we saw a couple of options for the mass spectrum of primordial black holes. It could be monochromatic, almost monochromatic, log normal, uh, and it could be um, uh, could have more interesting structure, but there's no reason to expect that it would be the same as the one from stellar black holes. Orbital, orbital eccentricity. So as I said, initially, it should be very high, regardless of the mechanism of formation, as a result of the binary capture mechanism. But then, of course, as with time, the orbit uh, circularizes as energy is lost. And so with LIGO, which can only detect the last few cycles of the inspiral before the merger, there's not much hope to detect the eccentricity, at least in all of the events, but there may be some events which merge quickly enough and have initial values of the eccentricity that are, that are high enough, such that LIGO can see the traces of the eccentricity uh, in the initial inspiral cycles that it sees, okay? Um, but future uh, experiments will be able to see, if they see more of the inspiral stage, they will definitely be able to see this eccentricity. Um, then there's the spin distribution. We expect um, basically uh, no spin or very small spin uh, for the black hole, primordial black holes as they are produced because there's not much, much angular momentum. Uh, it's not like, like in, in stars which are uh, uh, spin around themselves uh, quickly as a result of the whole formation process of the star itself and everything. Um, so we don't expect the initial spins to be very large. And also since uh, the, the binaries are formed through dynamical formation, there is no reason to expect the orientation of the spin to be the same. So if we look at, uh, if we also consider the orientation of the spin that we can measure that with LIGO, then we, we can also distinguish between those and um, binary stars, which uh, usually have spins that are uh, um, aligned with the, with the uh, um, or perpendicular to the plane where, um, to the plane of the orbit. Okay, another uh, uh, signature is the this, is this stochastic background. So beyond the events that are detected, there's a host of events that are sub-threshold. Uh, they form a stochastic background um, because some of them, you know, there, there are events happening all the time. And they're below threshold, but the contribution, the overall contribution of these um, uh, events that are below threshold still exists in both, in all the same, all the detector signals. 
So if you correlate the detector time streams, you can, you can find um, this correlated source of noise or source of signal um, and detect the stochastic background. And the stochastic background coming from uh, primordial black holes will have a unique frequency spectrum different uh, from the one that comes from stars. And finally, 3D clustering. Um, for example, if we are talking about the second mechanism where uh, the binaries mostly are formed in low dark matter mass halos, those are less um, uh, correlated with uh, the halos which host galaxies. So if I take a catalog of events, of gravitational wave events, and correlate it with a galaxy survey, I shouldn't necessarily see a high cross correlation if uh, the second mechanism is in play. Okay. All right, so let's, let's go one by one over these signatures and talk about them. Um, so um, first, if we want to understand the mass spectrum, uh, we need to understand what is the background. It's like an indirect detection where you try to find gamma rays uh, from the galactic center. You need, to, you need to understand the background that comes from the astrophysics in order to be able to detect a peak or a signal beyond that background. So again, here we have to understand what the stellar black holes uh, predict and then try to see if we get deviation from it. So the simplest ansatz for the stellar black hole mass function uh, is just a power law. And the reason for that is that uh, the initial mass function for stars, Salpeter's initial mass function, uh, is just a, a power law uh, with, a, with this index, two point, minus 2.35. This is exactly the value that Salpeter found using a very small uh, set of stars in the 1950s, but uh, since then it has held up. It, uh, it has held up, and it still uh, holds for the stellar population today. And if we assume that that just carries over from the stars to the black holes, so each star loses some of the mass before it becomes a black hole, but if they all lose more or less the same uh, relative amount of mass, then we can assume that the power law carries over. Okay. Now we can take this simple power law and uh, add to it a low mass cutoff because there's some transition between when a, a black hole is formed and when a neutron star is formed. Then we can impose a high mass cutoff because again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't expect very, very uh, massive stars to retain their mass all the way to when they uh, explode and leave a remnant behind. So maybe there's an exponential fall off or something like that. So that's maybe the most, most maybe the simplest black hole mass function for stars. There are other options, basically a combination of cutoffs and peaks. Uh, so you see below here from the, I don't have a reference here, but it's the recent LIGO uh, paper from a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there's several cutoffs here, several options for the cutoffs. We can have a sharp cutoff or a smooth cutoff uh, corresponding to the transition from generating neutron stars to black holes as the mass of the star, the progenitor star increases. We have a cutoff at some high mass motivated by the parent stability supernova model. So the parent stability supernova model says that stars uh, more massive than around 150 solar masses, they have a core that is so hot that gamma rays are so energetic that they can form electron positron pairs. Once they form electron positron pairs, uh, the radiation pressure which supports the core against collapse is reduced. It's reduced, so the core contracts the pressure increases even more, it gets heated up even more. The gamma rays are even more energetic. They have even more probability to generate electron positron pairs, which then again causes more contraction because of, loss of, because of the loss of pressure. And then this is a runaway process that basically disintegrates the star uh, without leaving any remnant behind. So it's thought that beyond some mass for the stars, the progenitor star, no black hole is left behind. Uh, and the mass of the star, 150 solar masses, corresponds to something on the order of 50 solar masses for the stars. So that should predict a cutoff. You see the cutoff here, and here, and here. Now you see that in some cases there's a peak before the cutoff. So why should we expect a peak before the cutoff? A peak that before the cutoff can come from pulsational pair instability supernovae. So in mass ranges for the stars between 100 and 150 or so, we don't quite have this runaway process of pair instability, but we have a series of pulses where some mass is lost and then the star uh, through an uh, oxygen or, or uh, flash, and then the, the, some mass is lost and then the star uh, stabilizes at, uh, at a new radius for the core. It's not yet hot enough to generate this runaway process of, of electron positron production, but, but uh, in a series of pulses, 
the star loses mass until it reaches around 100 solar mass or so. And then from 100 solar masses, it just uh, explodes in a supernova and generates a black hole of around 40 solar masses or so. So that means that all the stars between 100 and 150 accumulate as if they all, in, in, the, in terms of the black hole, as if they all had an initial mass of about 100 solar masses. So that's why they generate a peak just before the uh, cutoff from parent instability. And then, of course, um, you could have a series of peaks coming from hierarchical mergers. If you have, uh, say now you have a peak at around 30 solar masses from uh, maybe, maybe from primordial black holes. Uh, if those are in environments that uh, merge onto second, into second generations and third generations, you could see uh, a series of peaks, okay? Um, so that could come from dynamical dense environments, either of primordial black holes or of uh, normal black holes. Okay. So given the simplest ansatz, the one with just the mass function and some cutoffs, this is what we expect the observed mass distribution with a few years of A-LIGO data to look like. So you see that the observed mass distribution should have, should peak at high masses. So it, maybe it's not so surprising that there was a peak uh, in the data that I showed you at the beginning of the, the first talk, there was a peak at around 30 solar masses. But still, with a lot of statistics, if we have error bars as good as this in the bins that I uh, distributed the data into here and thousands of events, if we add a dark matter contribution with say some mass function that looks like a Gaussian with some width uh, and we center it at 30 solar masses, then maybe we could see a peak like that, okay? Um, and if we don't see a peak, we can set a bound on such a mass function for the uh, primordial black holes, okay? So that's one way to go about it. Of course, here I was looking at uh, the one dimension mass uh, distribution, but you could use the 2D mass distribution. So you put the uh, primary mass of the black hole, the more massive uh, black hole in each uh, binary, and the, sorry, the more massive and the uh, less massive, and then um, the more massive and the less massive, you put them in a 2D plot. And then if you have an excess around 30 solar masses, um, you would see it uh, even more strongly because the background is lower at 30 at this um, point here, which corresponds to around 30 and 30 for both events. Okay, um, so if we sum up the constraints that we can put from the mass, uh, from the mass spectrum, they greatly depend on how the binaries are formed, whether they are formed in present day halos, and there, you, there, then the rate is not so high and with future LIGO data you might get a limit on the fraction of dark matter in black holes, uh, which would be around maybe 10% or so uh, at best, or 50% at best, around 30 solar masses. Or if they are formed in the early universe, again, the merger rate is so high that you would expect uh, uh, a very large number of mergers if the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes is not negligible. And in this paper, we found that Already from existing LIGO 01 and 02 data, you could place a limit, potential limit, on the fraction of dark matter in black holes, which is lower than a percent. Again, this assumed that these binaries are not disrupted. Um, and so uh, we have to see the scenes talks and also Karsten Jadamzik's talks uh, later this week to see if, whether these uh, limits hold or not. Okay, let me move on to the second uh, signature. The second signature is eccentricity. <clears throat> so again, if we focus especially uh, on this model, it's also true for the other uh, mechanism. The initial conditions for the formation for the binary capture just depend on the impact parameter and the relative velocity. And those map directly onto the semi-major axis and the eccentricity of the binary that is produced. Um, so this is a PDF of the initial eccentricity depending on the halo mass, which hosts uh, the pair of primordial black holes, which we assume to have 30 solar masses here. So here you see one minus the eccentricity and very, very small values. So you see that the eccentricity is very, very large, very close to one. Now, as the black holes coalesce, the orbit circularizes, but the merger time is very short for eccentricities that approach one, okay? This is a strong power law dependence uh, with the eccentricity for the merger time. Uh, so as the eccentricity approaches one, the mergers can happen uh, from minutes after the binary capture to thousands of years uh, that, that quickly. Um, now, if we look at the PDF of the eccentricity, not at formation, 
but as the uh, as the signal enters the LIGO band, um, then the goal would be to detect a deviation from eccentricity of zero. And you can see that something like 1% of the, of the events should have detectable eccentricity, which we define as something with greater than 0.2 uh, eccentricity as the uh, event enters the LIGO band. So in the final stages of the in spiral process, which we can see with LIGO. So how do you detect eccentricity? Instead of seeing this signal, this normal waveform in the, this chirp, which has a single frequency at each moment in time, because if the binary is circular, then at each moment in time, there's just one frequency that describes the system, just from symmetry arguments. But if we have eccentricity, then instead of just one frequency at each point in time and one chirp, you would have a series, a harmonic series of chirps like this, okay, like the picture on the, on the right. Uh, so this is from my paper where we derived this in uh, 2016. And now the question is whether we have enough signal to noise to detect these higher harmonics or not. And you can do the calculation. And it turns out that with LIGO, you don't have very high sensitivity, again, because you only see the last cycles of the in spiral and the signal to noise in general is not that good. So maybe, maybe a handful of events we'll be able to detect with large enough eccentricity. In the distant future, there will be the Einstein telescope, which will be much more sensitive. It will be underground um, and, uh, uh, and uh, more sensitive than, than LIGO. So that might be able to detect uh, on the order of a dozen events or so with uh, traces of eccentricity. But if we look in the even more distant future and we imagine LISA in space, so here we see a plot of the uh, noise, noise spectra. Here there's the noise spectra of LIGO. This is the seismic noise, which, uh, the, which gives us this wall uh, of noise, which means that below around 10 or 20 hertz, we cannot see anything with LIGO. Uh, here, there's the noise power spectrum of LISA. And this is the um, signal from um, a binary source, such as the first event that was detected by LIGO. So you can see that we, what we see in LISA is this stage of in spiral and then merger, okay? With LISA, we could see the initial parts of this separation on the order of 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus one hertz. So we can see months and months of, uh, of cycles of in-spiral in LISA. And um, from that, since it's so early on in the in-spiral process, we can certainly have a higher chance to see, to detect the eccentricity. In this paper with, co with colleagues, we showed um, that um, um, you can take events detected in LIGO uh, and then look back in time, say, Lisa's, say that LISA is in space and has been operating for a few years, and we also have LIGO or the future network of detectors on Earth operating. We can take the catalog from the events on the ground, the terrestrial detected events, and then go back to LISA data and try to extract the signal from, uh, in, to extract the signal in LISA. The signal in LISA for um, 30 solar mass events is not gonna be very high. LISA was uh, designed to detect uh, intermediate mass black hole mergers or supermassive black hole mergers, not stellar mass black hole mergers. But using the information from LIGO, we can go back to the LISA data and dig up the data from there uh, extrap by extrapolating the merger time and things like that from the LIGO signal to LISA. And then we can expect to boost the number of detections in LISA. So instead of uh, having just uh, uh, a certain number of detections in LISA, we can boost maybe the, de the detection by uh, maybe a factor of five or so. All right, so we could have hundreds of events in LISA to, to, be, uh, to detect uh, eccentricity from. The next is the distribution of spins. Um, so if black holes are uh, curved black holes, they have, they have a spin. The PBH initial spin, we can take several ansatzes for, for what the initial spin is. So here in a paper by Stefano Profumo and Fernandez, uh, we they assume just a Gaussian distribution of spins around some uh, average value. We expect uh, the spins to be very small. This has been worked out by several uh, uh, groups. We expect the spin, the, the spin, the initial spin at the formation, after the formation of the primordial black hole to be small, but it could with time, if there's accretion onto the primordial black hole, that could speed up uh, the spin. And so there could be a growth with uh, mass accretion uh, with time. So that's been worked out in this recent paper. But what LIGO measures is not really, well, it does measure the spin, does constrain the spin, the initial spin of the two uh, binary components, but with large error bars. What it measures better 
is the effective spin, is the quantity called the effective spin, which is the um, weighted sum of the uh, um, projections of the spins of the two black holes onto the, the, uh, uh, the, axis, onto the plane of the um, uh, coalescence, okay? And that for dynamical captures should be small. So if the system starts as a binary stellar system, and then each star becomes a black hole, they're revolving around each other from the, from the get-go, they all were, the, the two stars were initially formed from the same cloud of gas, then we should expect the angular momentum and the spin to be in the same direction, more or less. But if the binary is formed dynamically, so one primordial black hole uh, catch, is captured by another one, we shouldn't expect the spins to be oriented in any special way. And so this effective spin uh, should be consistent with zero. And indeed, this is from the recent uh, LIGO data that was just released from O3A. Uh, the O3A run, we see that most spins for, uh, uh, that are detected for the in LIGO are consistent with, most effective spins are consistent with zero. There are some high spin events, uh, which might not be consistent with primordial black, a primordial black hole origin, uh, unless there's some chance alignment. Uh, but most of the population is consistent with zero. Um, you'll probably hear more on this by Riotto, which worked out this accretion model, and by Stefano Profumo, who had uh, an analysis of this uh, later on this week. Okay, now for the stochastic background. Uh, Eli, uh, can we just take a few questions at this point? Uh, the, is the, does that work with you, or do you want to break a little later? I was hoping to finish this subsection and then... Sure, and then... Sure. Absolutely, no problem. So give me two more slides or three more slides and then I'll finish and, and take questions before I move on to direct attention. Sure. Well, stochastic background. So stochastic background is again this contribution coming from all the events that are sub-threshold. So we cannot, they're not strong enough in amplitude to be detected individually, but they do contribute a signal. Um, so if you uh, work that out, um, that depends of course on the rate of primordial black hole mergers on the energy emitted, uh, the, the spectrum, uh, and there's some spectral dependence. Um, and you can work out what that is. But what's important to understand is if you look at, if you consider the rate, you can, there's a stochastic background that should come from stellar black holes and there's a stochastic background that should come from primordial black holes. The, but the merger rate, which enters both calculations is very different uh, between stars and uh, black holes coming from stars and black holes that are formed primordially. Black holes coming from stars, um, they should follow, in terms of redshift, they should follow the star formation rate, which peaks at around the redshift of two and then becomes very small. But with primordial black holes, they're formed in the early universe and they keep forming binaries and these binaries merge. There's no reason for a peak at redshift two and, and, uh, and, and then a fall off as you go to higher and higher redshifts for the primordial black hole uh, distribution. So if you take these different rates and you plug them in here, you'll see a different spectral dependence for the contribution from primordial black holes. And you can use that to distinguish them from stars. Um, this is a calculation made, made in this paper of the contribution that you expect to get um, for the uh, total energy density in gravitational waves uh, um, in the stochastic background from primordial black holes for different mass functions plotted against the noise spectrum of different experiments. So with LIGO and NISA. So you see that with LIGO currently, you, sh you should not necessarily have expected to detect something maybe uh, if uh, the fraction of uh, dark matter in primordial black holes is one, but with LISA, you'll definitely be able to detect uh, a signal. Um, it's important though to make a point, not to, not to confuse the stochastic background that I just described, which comes from sub-threshold events with a stochastic background of gravitational waves generated uh, from the curvature perturbations that leads to the formation of the primordial black holes to begin with. Uh, this second contribution you're going to hear about uh, from Yassine and from, and in a, a certainly one talk um, uh, later this week, okay? But what I was talking about was sub-threshold events that contribute to a stochastic background. Finally, the last uh, uh, signature that I was describing in indirect detection has to do with clustering. So as I uh, explained before, most of the mergers, so the merger rate is dominated by halo masses, dark matter halo masses that are small, okay, on the order of a thousand or 10 or 10,000 uh, solar masses or so. These are low bias tracers of the underlying dark matter distribution. Um, 
the, the galaxies tend to form in the halos that are much, much larger than this, okay? That means that if you cross-correlate um, a gravitational wave event catalog, if you can localize the events well on the sky and you take the two-dimensional distribution or three-dimensional distribution and you correlate with galaxies, you should see an anti-correlation. And you can distinguish between the bias that you expect galaxies to have and the bias that you expect the progenitors or the dark matter hosts, uh, the dark matter halo hosts of primordial black hole binaries, you should be able to distinguish between those two biases. That depends on how well you can localize the events in LIGO. Um, so with a LIGO, uh, with the existing LIGO uh, apparatus, you really can't localize too well the different events. So here I'm showing three uh, events that were detected in 01, and you see the ellipses here that correspond to the localization that LIGO could determine for these. So you see that this is not really pinpointing the location of the events. But uh, these are, this is just using two LIGO detectors. In the future, we'll have the LIGO in India, we'll have Copper in Japan, we already have it. Uh, we have Virgo, which we can use for localization. Uh, so this LIGO network together, operating together, will be able to improve by almost two orders of magnitude the localization capabilities for the events. So we still would have two to five degrees uncertainty on the location, but at least that's improving. With Einstein telescope, we're gonna have sub-degree uh, localization. With sub-degree localization, you enter a stage where you can do this cross-correlation uh, with galaxy surveys more efficiently. And again, what you look for is the amplitude of the cross-correlation, which is related to how biased the population is or how, well, how good of a tracer it is of the underlying dark matter uh, fluctuations. Uh, and the goal is to reach a sensitivity that allows you to distinguish between uh, the contribution of stars, which should correlate well with uh, galaxies, and the contribution from black holes that are primordial, which should not necessarily correlate well with galaxies. And with advanced gravitational detectors, there's some prospects. So we need to cross this threshold here. Um, and you can see that with advanced, uh, 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 an advanced network, of LIGO or with Einstein telescope, you would be able to, to do this. Uh, so that's worked out in this paper. Okay, so now I'm going to stop uh, here for questions before I discuss uh, the new results from uh, LIGO's recent run. Thank you. Uh, thanks. There are only a couple of questions. There are uh, two that are related to uh, EM counterparts. So let me just tell them both together. Swapnil asks, what do you exactly mean by EM counterparts of gravitational waves from primordial black hole binary mergers? And Fazlu asks that uh, GW190521 with the final remnant, which has 142 solar masses, is thought to have an EM counterpart as reported by this Wiki transient facility. Okay. And we consider this as the EM counterpart prediction for PBH binary mergers. Okay, so for Thank the first so yeah. for the first question, what is an EM counterpart? An EM counterpart, uh, we, now, we now have entered multi-messenger astrophysics or multi-messenger astro astronomy. We can detect things not only in uh, electromagnetic uh, waves, but also in gravitational waves. An electromagnetic counterpart means that we can see a signal corresponding to the gravitational wave. So we see a gravitational wave coming towards us. And at the same time, we see an electromagnetic signal. This happened for the neutron star merger that LIGO detected, 1708-17, then the, in that case, we saw the gravitational wave merge signal, and we also saw uh, a signal uh, in a short gamma ray burst, and also we saw this, uh, the, a kilonova signal uh, related to the merger of the neutron stars. But in that, in neutron stars, you do expect to have electromagnetic counterparts. You expect the neutron stars to generate a short gamma ray burst when they merge, and you expect the, uh, the environment of the neutron stars to maybe generate uh, a kilonova uh, that we can detect. With black holes, that's not necessarily the case. Black holes may have accretion disks, and as the black holes merge, perhaps there is some interaction between the accretion disks that will cause them to heat up and release x-rays or something like that. But it doesn't have to be, and certainly it won't be for primordial black holes that reside in low dark matter mass halos where we don't have uh, any accretion disk around, okay? because there's nothing to accrete. Uh, so that's for the first part of the question. The second part of the question was related to a possible uh, electromagnetic counterpart that was reported for one of the gravitational wave signals in O3. Um, that counterpart uh, is not really consistent uh, with the data that we find from LIGO because uh, 
um, the distance inferred to the, uh, to the gravitational wave event from the amplitude of the waveform is much larger than the distance that uh, corresponds to the, this electromagnetic counterpart. So the location on the sky more or less agrees, but the distance does not agree. The counterpart claim was published before the analysis was done for the distance uh, calculated from the gravitational wave signal. So it was announced just based on the fact that on the sky, the two seem to be coming from the same location on the sky at the same time. But that doesn't mean that they come from the same distance. Uh, and so I don't think that uh, that counterpart signal is, uh, is really, uh, really holds water, but there are some claims that perhaps uh, the distance measurement in the gravitational wave event is wrong because there's a wrong assumption about the masses and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into that, uh, but personally, I don't take that uh, coincidence too seriously. Okay, we'll take one more question before we move on. Um, this is from Partham Zumda. When you talked of low spin of black holes, what did you mean? And how does the primordial, uh, why should primordial black holes necessarily have small spins? So it's not clear that they should have, it's not necessarily clear that they should have small spin, uh, but there's no reason to think that when these primordial uh, black holes are formed from, from just the, the collapse of an overdensity, there's no reason to think that there's large angular momentum there uh, that should uh, uh, correspond to then an initial high spin for the black hole. This is uh, not, this is unlike the status for uh, normal stellar black holes, which formed from a star, which initially had to have had to form from a cloud of gas that had to uh, had to be spinning and cooling down in order to generate the star, and then this angular momentum uh, resulted in, in, in an angular momentum for the star, which then, when it explodes, results in an angular momentum or a spin for the for the primordial for the stellar black hole. Uh, so there is a clear distinction between the formation of primordial black holes and stellar black holes. And while you should expect maybe some spin distribution, non-zero spin distribution for stars, there's no a priori good reason to uh, think that primordial black holes will have high spin at formation. Um, but you'll hear more, more of that, I'm sure, from Stefano and from Antonio later this week. So I don't want to get into that in more detail. Okay, um, so this is a pedagogical talk. I think you can just answer this, what you meant by low spin, for those who might not be familiar with uh, units of, sorry. Low spin is spin consistent with zero. Okay, so it's a curved black hole, but the spin is consistent with zero. Right. And one last thing, maybe you will be answering this later on, so I won't, you can choose to uh, discuss it later. Uh, from Sanchetna Chatterjee, Suchetna Chatterjee, is there any predicted effect of these primordial black hole mergers in the CMB? Oh yeah, yeah. let's talk about that later. Okay, that okay. has to do with indirect detection, that has to do with direct detection, that is, which is the next part of the talk. Okay. Good. So why don't we continue now? Yeah. Okay. So this indirect detection part, the gravitational wave part, uh, this is the data uh, from O3A, from the last uh, LIGO run, which we put together here in terms of the distribution of mass in M1, in M2, so the primary mass, the secondary mass, this is the mass ratio, and this is the redshift where these uh, mergers are coming from. So this is the distribution from the data itself. And now you can try to fit this data with different models. So you can try to fit it with a static channel of stellar black holes with dy a dynamic channel of, uh, of um, uh, formation with a dynamic channel of stellar black holes. So these would be uh, black hole batteries formed in globular clusters, for example, where you can assume high ejection rate from the globular cluster or a low ejection rate. So there's a lot, a lot of model dependence, but you can see that you fairly well can fit the data with stellar black holes. However, you can also try to fit the data with primordial black holes, and that has been done uh, just last week uh, by a group at Johns Hopkins uh, and uh, in collaboration with Antonio Riotto and, and collaborators. So what they did is they took a log normal mass function, which is what you expect if you have a symmetric peak in the, in the power spectrum. Um, and with this, this set of parameters, and in particular, a fraction less than 1% of uh, the total dark matter in primordial black holes, and this blue mass function, they found a pretty good fit to the data. Okay, so consistent with the, uh, with the mass ratio distribution, Q is the mass ratio M2 over M1 in each binary, and consistent with uh, a distribution of spins, uh, which is fairly small. So this is the spin of the black holes. You see that uh, 
the prediction from the primordial black holes is small uh, compared to the one you expect from stars. And here's the contribution, and here's the, uh, uh, the effective spin. Uh, so that's the, sum, the weighted sum of the projections of the spins. Uh, and again, you can see the difference between PDHs and what you expect uh, default from a star. And this fit is pretty good. So I would, I would see this as just an initial study, uh, which we need to uh, improve on. And of course, what will uh, uh, determine uh, uh, for certain whether this works or not is more data. So this is just using 39 events or 40 events total from the two runs, uh, but we're going to have we're going to have thousands of events in a few years. So this this sort of analysis is going to improve uh, a lot. Okay, so let me move on now to a different topic, the last topic, which is direct detection and how you can constrain uh, primordial black holes with various kinds of measurements. So now. Uh, we can take an agnostic approach and assume that primordial black holes can have any mass, any mass range really, uh, spanning between these mass ranges. Um, um, we shouldn't expect black holes to have to be more massive than the most massive dark matter halos in the universe. That's then they won't. They, then they certainly can't comprise a large fraction of the dark matter. So we stop at some high mass uh, um, um, scale, and then at low masses. Uh, sorry, to orient you, this is where 30 solar masses is, okay? So 30 solar mass PBH is the ones that may be related to LIGO or uh, are located here. Um, we can't have black holes really, primordial black holes form a large fraction of dark matter today if they are too small because they would just evaporate due to Hawking radiation, uh, emission of Hawking radiation in less than a Hubble time if they are, uh, if they are not massive enough. So below some scale, uh, they would evaporate and that, that uh, closes that window uh, of masses. Um, but then we have this huge range of mass scales, which where we could have in principle from a, a, a significant fraction of dark matter made up of uh, primordial black holes. So how do we start to constrain this huge landscape? One way to do it is through lensing constraints, and I'll describe those in a minute, which generally push on the window from low masses on the LIGO window. Another way is to use dynamical constraints. Uh, so constraints related to, to uh, disruption of structure in globular clusters, in uh, dense uh, dwarf galaxies. Um, you would see an impact on the density profile of those if the dark matter is not made up of uh, very, very small particles, but made up of chunks of uh, large chunks of dark matter. You would see some graininess uh, in the uh, density spectrum. And if you don't see that graininess, you can put constraints, dynamical constraints, uh, that push on the, uh, on the LIGO window from the right, from the high mass range. And of course, you can use accretion on uh, the signals from accretion and then emission from the accretion disk. Uh, and especially uh, the CMB constraints that the Asim will talk about, they also push on this window from the right. But let's start with lensing. Okay, so let me explain the idea behind microlensing and how that can be used to constrain primordial black holes. So the idea is this, we on Earth are observing a star and uh, along the line of sight or close to the line, line of sight passes a black hole between us and the star that we're looking at. The Einstein radius of the, of the black hole is related to the mass of the black hole and the distance from us to the, to, the, to the black hole. But we can only observe light from stars in nearby objects. So maybe the large Magellanic cloud, the Andromeda galaxy, but not much farther away than that. So the distances are most, are all most of the, um, mostly the same uh, distance, kiloparsecs or so. And then the velocity with which the black hole travels uh, in, in a normal halo is around 100 kilometers per second. We know that. So from just these two scales, the velocity and the Einstein radius, we can determine what is the time scale of the magnification that you should see from the gravitational uh, uh, lensing effect of the black hole on the light from the star. And this time scale uh, just turns out to be for masses that are of order 10 solar masses or so, it turns out to be years. Okay, for much smaller masses, the time scale is much smaller than a year, which means that if you observe a star for let's say a month, uh, and it was uh, gravitationally lensed by a passing uh, massive object, such as a black hole, you would have seen uh, the light from the star follow this light curve, okay? So it, it would be something, then it would be, it would be magnified, and then it would go back to, the, to what it was before. But if we have, the, if the lenses are very massive, 
This period would take years, which means that you wouldn't know whether you're at a peak right now or whether, whether you're here, okay? So you would have to observe stars for years and years and years to be able to determine whether you saw a magnification event. Of course, you don't observe just one star, you observe millions of stars. Uh, and from the fact that you don't detect, uh, uh, if anything, maybe a handful of events or so, you can put a constraint on what is the abundance of uh, macros or primordial black holes uh, between, you know, in, in, in space, so between you and the stars. Uh, but this is hard to do for high masses. So microlensing constraints, they certainly rule out this uh, range of masses, but they don't really probe into the black hole window. Um, there's, there's gonna be a talk uh, this week about Subaru and, and, uh, and, and you'll hear more about lensing and microlensing and how exactly that works. So I, 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 I'm just going to use this description. Okay, so now if I focus on the window again, focus on the LIGO window again, and I have these microlensing constraints that creep into the window from the left from the low mass range, uh, we see that the rest is open. Um, and um, the point about the LIGO window is that in the past, there were claimed bounds coming from wide binaries. So these are wide binaries in the galaxy that we see. So these are binaries that we see that are bound, uh, two stars that are bound in the galaxy. And if there were, there were a lot of primordial black holes running around, they would disrupt the binary. So just from the fact that we see a wide binary, we can place a constraint on uh, the number of primordial black holes, but that has been revisited and sort of cleaned out. So you see that it now no longer um, according to the updated, ana updated analysis, it no longer uh, affects this LIGO window. There used to be CMB constraints uh, from around uh, 10, more than 10 years ago, which really ruled out conclusively this whole window. But those have been revisited mainly by uh, Yassine in his work, in his seminal work from 2016. And now the most conservative CMB bound, again, doesn't really touch on the window. It reaches 100 solar masses or so, but it doesn't prevent uh, a fraction of one uh, uh, for the dark matter in primordial black holes in the range between 20 or 30 solar masses or so to 100. Uh, you'll hear more about, about this CMB bound from Yassine's talks and Vivian's talks. They will go through this in detail and calculate it and, and explain the uncertainties and everything. Um, so what does this mean? This means that we have this opportunity here to hide the dark matter in primordial black holes of this mass range. And the question is whether we can think of some other um, type of uh, signature that would rule this out. What we did is to start, is to think beyond the microlensing limits. So we thought about a different source that could be microlensed, and that's fast radio bursts. So what are fast radio bursts? Fa fast radio bursts are exactly what, what uh, the name says. So this is a, an image of a flux uh, in radio emission uh, detected um, uh, in Australia. Um, with a Parkes telescope. And you can see here, there's, there's a signal that there's suddenly a peak here, and then the signal continues. The peak width is of order of a millisecond. Um, so literally, this is a fast burst. Um, it's in, in the radio, in radio frequency, so it's a fast radio burst. And the burst itself is pretty strong. So if you look at the amplitude of this, it's about one Jansky, which if the fast radio burst is coming from cosmological distances, a gigaparsec or, or, gigaparsec or so, that should correspond to an isotropic energy emission of around 30, 10 to, to the 39 Hertz. So this is not quite gamma ray burst-like uh, amplitudes, but it's still pretty big. Um, so regardless of what the origin is for the fast radio burst, the important thing is that the rate for these inferred by the, by the detections that we have so far is very large. We expect that on order 10,000 fast radio bursts cross the sky across our sky every day. Um, and, uh, and now the question is, what if we start observing them in large numbers? If we observe them in large numbers, then it could happen that if one of these uh, fast radio bursts on its way to us passes close to a, close enough to a primordial black hole, then the image of the source fast radio burst will be lensed. And since these are distinct bursts, and the solution to the lens equation is, is, this is a quadratic equation, the solution is that we see two images. Instead of seeing one burst, we will see two bursts, okay? The separation uh, between the burst and the flux amplitude are the only observables that we have in this case. So we see one burst, and then we see a second burst with some ratio of amplitudes, 
and some distance in time between them. And um, uh, it turns out that the time that, uh, okay. And now there's a limit on these observables. If the flux ratio is too large between the images, then we won't be able to see the second image. So the flux ratio cannot be too large. Then the time delay also has to be large enough. It has to be larger than a millisecond or so. Otherwise, the two bursts will just be on top of one another and we wouldn't be able to distinguish between them and determine that we have a repeater, okay? And it turns out that the time delay for lens masses of order 30 solar masses and cosmological distances just happens to be around a millisecond. So this is very fortunate. It means that we should see for uh, uh, lenses that are as massive as 30 solar masses or so, if the source FRB passes close to the black hole on the way to us, then we should see two clear bursts separated by the border the size of the burst itself. Um, and now we can take an experiment such as CHIME, which has already been running uh, for uh, about two years or so, and has detected and has started detecting FRBs. It's detected more than a thousand already. If uh, it detects 10,000 or so, then we can calculate the optical depth to be lens. Um, we can do that calculation based on this flux ratio in time delay uh, requirements that I just described and the sensitivity of the experiment. And so if we put, uh, um, if we calculate this optical depth and it works out to be something like a percent, that would mean that uh, in, in 10,000 uh, fast radio bursts, around 10 to 100 should be lensed. So we should see a repeater. Now, if we don't see a repeater, that means that we can close down the window. Okay, so with fast radio burst with about an observation of about 10,000 of those, you can reach a limit which goes down to uh, as low as 1% of the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes. Where this limit cuts off depends on the intrinsic width of the fast radio burst, because as I, as I explained before, we need the time delay to be large enough uh, so such that uh, the bursts, uh, the two bursts are separated clearly and, and are not overlapping. If the burst initially is wide, then we need a larger time delay or a larger lens mass to be able to see two bursts. So, uh, so that where this cuts off really depends on the uh, uh, intrinsic width of the fast radio bursts. But uh, from the observations that we have uh, now, which are about 100 fast radio bursts or so, uh, which have been published already, uh, we see that most of them have a width of around one millisecond. So this should be a very promising way to um, rule out this window. Um, and it might already be doable with the uh, data set that Chime uh, has right now. So I, I see this as a very uh, promising uh, bound for this window. With time, of course, this should only improve. The more fast radio bursts you detect, if you don't see them repeating, you should, you should uh, be more confident in your bound. One thing I should mention is that some fast radio bursts are already observed to repeat. And there's also uh, the possibility that there's a repetition in the fast radio burst signal, not from lensing, but from something that happens at the source. However, you can certainly separate from, from repetitions that are related to lensing and repetitions which are not related to lensing. If they are related, related to lensing, then the flux ratio and the time delay are clearly correlated. Okay, so this is the uh, calculation of what the correlation should be between the flux ratio and the time delays. So if you, see, if you do see a set of repeating FRBs, you can certainly determine if that's coming from lensing or not. Okay, so that's important. All right, uh, let me go on. Uh, so if, if I now look at this window, the LIGO window, it's, it's starting to close. Okay, so this is where we were a few years ago. Uh, we now have dynamical constraints uh, from the density profiles of ultra faint dwarfs, uh, which starts to start to creep in into this window. We have a nice paper on uh, the uh, effect of uh, uh, weak, weak lensing statistics on supernovae, type 1a, which come from redshifts of about one, uh, from which you can infer a robust but weak bound uh, on the fraction of dark matter in, in primordial black holes. We have these bounds that I talked about before, the, direct, the indirect constraints from uh, just the merger rate, um, which I said, which are in dashed here because there's some question about them. And we have this prediction for the bounds that can come from fast radio burst lensing, which are also dashed because we don't yet have them. But you can see that this window is closing. 
And now, um, so yeah, for more detail about this, uh, look out for these talks uh, um, by Flickr and Jatamsic uh, later this week. So now the observational outlook for this, so uh, gravitational waves, uh, the experiments should be uh, um, starting to, to go, uh, starting to uh, go online within five to 10 years. And these will really allow us not to, to probe not just the mass spectrum, but also the spin and the eccentricity and the stochastic background and the clustering that I described before. And we have these FRB experiments, which may end up scooping the gravitational wave uh, experiments in terms of uh, constraining this LIGO window because they are already taking place. Uh, and I really believe this is a strong constraint. Okay, what about other windows? So here, um, I took a series of plots from a recent paper by uh, Bernard Carr and colleagues um, uh, discussing different types of signatures, different types of uh, constraints that can be placed uh, on primordial black holes with different, in different mass ranges. So here, it's, this, these are mass ranges below the evaporation limit, um, where you could have a primordial black hole population that is relevant early on, even if they um, um, then Hawking uh, evapor evaporate due to Hawking radiation emission, they still could be relevant early on, and there are ways to probe these. These are um, constraints related to lensing. So we have this uh, macho constraint, ah. super constraint, and all of those. Um, so they probe a nice uh, part of parameter space here. Then there are these dynamical constraints, which I alluded to, uh, such as those coming Okay, such as those coming from uh, uh, the density profiles of uh, dense objects. Like, are, uh, like, sorry, just for a few seconds, you got muted because of some technical glitch. Yeah. If you can just repeat your last sentence. Yeah. Okay, so we have the lensing constraints here, which are mostly concentrated in this mass range. We have dynamical constraints, which are mostly concentrated in high mass, uh, in the high mass range, as I discussed before. There are some constraints related to neutron disruption of neutron stars or white dwarfs due to the passage of primordial black holes through them, which might lead them to explode. But these, are, these rely on a lot of assumptions, so that's why they are uh, justifiably dashed here in the paper by Carr, so I, I wouldn't necessarily take them too seriously. And then there's um, another series of, um, of limits, which I would say, uh, 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 well, let's me, let me skip those. Um, you'll hear more about uh, all of these constraints from Carl's talks, uh, from Lahaz talks, Takis talk, Garcia Belido will talk about this, I'm sure. Um, so all of these, what's important to understand is that, there's, is that there's a host of signatures for primordial black holes, and you can use all of them to try to constrain uh, the mass, uh, uh, the fraction of dark matter for different masses uh, in the form of primordial black holes. If I try to take all of these together, okay, so I take all of those, all of the important limits or the robust limits from the previous plot and put them all on the same plot here. So this is from a recent paper. Then we see that there's now uh, a new window, okay? A new window has opened up uh, from around 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 22 uh, grams uh, or so. The reason this is new is that, there is that there used to be constraints here, which are no longer considered to be valid. Um, so now this is, this is an unconstrained region. One promising way of probing it is through second order gravitational waves that if, that may be produced, if the curvature, perturb if these primordial black holes here are formed from, from uh, large curvature perturbations, then these lar large curvature perturbations at second order, even though these are scalar perturbations, they will produce uh, tensor fluctuations, which will be able, we, will, we will be able to see in gravitational waves and the frequencies that correspond to them, if the mass range is this, this is the frequency range. So about 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two hertz, which is definitely detectable by Lisa. So you'll hear more about from your scene about how these second order gravitational waves are produced. And, uh, and then you can uh, consider this signal as well. Um, finally, um, I, yeah, okay. Finally, there's, we can, you can go in the other direction. So instead of um, looking for uh, limits on the primordial spectrum of perturbations and generating limits on primordial black holes, you can look at the other, other, in the other direction. You can take these, these limits on primordial black holes and convert them 
to limits on the primordial power spectrum of perturbations because you know that if uh, there are no, there's not a large number of primordial black holes in this mass range, for example, that limits the, uh, the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum at the scales that correspond to this mass range. Okay, so you can take this and you can uh, generate a limit, okay, infer a limit on the curvature power spectrum. So this is taking all these limits on the PBHs and converting them to limits on the primordial power spectrum. And if you take from Bernard Carr's paper, all of these hundreds of uh, different signatures, you see that you can start probing uh, the primordial power spectrum. So it doesn't probe it to very low values. This is very far from uh, what we know uh, is the case at C and B scales, but it's an interesting constraint. Uh, finally, related to this, so here, here the constraints are from primordial black holes. I put them here on the power spectrum. This is in this, the measurements from the C and B. So we know that the power spectrum is of the order of 10 to the minus nine at C and B scales. We don't know what happens to it after it goes to smaller and smaller scales, but we will have measurements from spectral distortions of the C and B and from pulsar timing arrays. We will have measurements that will constrain the power spectrum. And the important point to make here is that these are going to probe the fraction down to very low values of the fraction of dark matter that can be in primordial black holes. If you really low the, lower the fraction, then you can constrain not, not only the scenario that primordial black holes form the dark matter, but also the scenario that they form the supermassive black hole seeds that I described at the beginning of the talk. Um, and you see that there are some windows here at mass scales which may be relevant, um, but uh, in recent analysis, we showed that even this window uh, can be closed using the combination of uh, spectral distortion experiments and pulsar timing arrays. Uh, and there will be a talk that might be related to this uh, on Friday that you, you should look out for. Okay, so the takeaway from, from my talks was uh, that you can definitely test this scenario of primordial black holes playing a part in explaining the rate or the outlier events in LIGO in providing the supermassive black hole seeds or in explaining all of dark matter, you can definitely test it in a lot of ways. Um, from the theory side, we described uh, the indirect detection method, which is basically focusing on the gravitational waves that are emitted as two primordial black holes annihilate. And you can use the mass function, the orbital eccentricity, the spatial clustering, the spin distribution, the stochastic background, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's a series of direct constraints you can place. So this includes C and B anisotropies, uh, dynamical constraints, and also these fast radio bursts that I described. And really what we have to do now is wait for the experiments. And uh, the point here is that the next decade is promising. So I think that all of these methods to probe um, uh, primordial black holes should, um, should, be, should become fully doable over the next decade with, uh, with um, gravitational wave experiments, with fast radio experiments, and with also with future CMB experiments, uh, and so on. Okay, so let me stop here. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll, we have time for a few questions uh, that are here. And so let me quickly go through them. Um, there's one from Sukanya Bhattacharya. Uh, she asks, for stochastic gravitational wave background signal, can a combination of stochastic signal from sub-threshold merger events and stochastic gravitational wave background from large curvature perturbations mimic the stochastic gravitational wave background expected from stellar black holes? Ah, no, no, that, that, that is hard to believe. So I understand, uh, it's a nice question. First of all, these would be at different frequencies. So the frequencies corresponding to the, um, to the stochastic, to the second order stochastic background generated from large curvature perturbations at second order, uh, that will probably peak at very different frequencies uh, than the one from coming from sub-threshold merger events. So, so first of all, they should not sum together in the, in the detector, okay? Even if somehow they do, they would not have this, the same spectral, uh, the same frequency dependence that corresponds to a peak uh, in, in star formation rate at redshift of two. There's no reason uh, for that to magically happen, but it's a good question. So there's a question from Ashu Kushwaha about constraints for PBHs in the mass range, 10 to the 17 grams to 10 to the 25 grams. But I think you've sort of addressed that in your, uh, in your slides already. Okay. Um, unless there's anything else you want to say? The question was, is there any assumption made to get these constraints? 
But is there anything in addition to what you've already said that you want to add here? Um, well, I, I would add this. I would add that there's, there are a lot of assumptions that enter each and every one of these uh, constraints. That is the problem. Um, but some of them are certainly more robust than others. Uh, but um, uh, you can have a whole talk on each of these constraints, okay? So I can talk about the fast radio burst constraints for, I already talked about them for 10 minutes, I could have talked about them for an hour. You can take microlensing and talk about that for half an hour, and you will hear a talk about that uh, later this week. You can talk about the CMB constraints for two hours. Yasin is going to, and Vivian is going, are going to do that. Um, what I wanted to do is, is present you with a big picture, okay? The, to, so that you can consider the production of black hole, of armored black holes, the annihilation of them and the gravitational wave signal coming from that and the different six signatures in the gravitational waves that you can see and the direct constraints, which just correspond to the influence that primordial black holes would have on standard astrophysical measurements, whether these are CMB related or light from stars or, or fast radio bursts or whatever. Uh, I wanted to give you the overall bird's eye view and then you'll hear in much more detail about all of this uh, from the experts uh, throughout the week. Uh, from Swapnam, do primordial black holes mainly form from dark matter or is there a possibility of their formation from baryonic matter as well? Ah, they don't form from dark matter. The whole point about primordial black holes as an explanation of dark matter is that they do not form for, from dark matter. They form from radiation. They form from, uh, in the early universe, from over dense regions in uh, which, and basically the universe is radiation dominated. So, so these over dense regions just collapse they form uh, a black. They form black holes, and if these black holes um, are abundant enough, they can explain the dark matter because they are, they act exactly like dark matter. They only uh, are affected by gravity, um, and uh, if there is no other way to detect them, maybe they can uh, and rule them out. Maybe they can uh, account for the dark matter that we see in the universe. So it's not that they're made up of dark matter. On the contrary they replace dark matter. So you don't have to think of any dark matter sector, any dark matter particle. You just assume that portions, under, uh, over dense portions of, of radiation in the early universe collapsed into these black holes and they are now the dark matter. So in fact, your answer sort of addresses the next question and an earlier question. Suppose, okay. this is from Suchetna Chatterjee, supposing black, primordial black holes form some substantial fraction of dark matter in the universe, does it have any effect on the constraints obtained on dark matter from other experiments, as we heard today morning? Let us say matter power, for example, the matter power spectrum. Will that be consistent if dark matter is from primordial black holes? And there was an, an earlier question that would it, if primordial black holes form the dark matter, would it also explain the velocity rotation curves in galaxies? Okay. So uh, regarding the galaxies, yes, if primordial black holes are, are not as big, as large as uh, in terms of mass as the galaxy itself, uh, then you would then it, then they behave from the, from your point of view they behave exactly as a particle. Uh, in 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 n body simulations, for example, where you see uh, uh, these rotation curves and you can simulate them uh, very nicely, in simulations you have to understand that um, uh, each particle in the simulation. Uh, in an n-body simulation is already something like 10 to the seven solar masses. So if primordial black holes are 30 solar masses or so, that's nothing compared to the resolution that you have in these simulations. So, so that does not uh, affect that. You, you can certainly uh, have uh, rotation curves and things like that behave normally with uh, dark matter in the form of primordial black holes. Now, people were asking about um, constraints on, on primordial black holes as a fraction of dark matter. So that's exactly what I what I uh, been saying is that um, so these are constraints on primordial black holes as a fraction of dark matter. For example, here this constraint, the CMB constraint, is a constraint on the fraction of dark. Uh, so, which this means that even um, ten to the minus three of the dark matter cannot be in uh, in primordial black holes of of a thousand solar masses or so. Otherwise, that would disrupt the CMB. So yes, definitely you can constrain even a fraction of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes, assuming all the rest of dark matter is in some other form, axions, WIMPs, whatever. There is a special thing to say about 
the combination of WIMPs and primordial black holes in particular. Because if you have primordial black holes and you have the rest of dark matter in WIMPs in particular, then the signal for WIMP annihilation in accretion disks around the black holes should be so large that you might have been able to see it already. So in, so in a sense, WIMP, the combination of WIMPs and primordial black holes um, is uh, uh, not necessarily viable, but that also depends on a lot of assumptions. So um, I would take it seriously, but not necessarily uh, as fully robust. We'll take the last two questions uh, from Amol Dege. For the estimated rate of fast radio bursts, what is the threshold energy taken to be? Um, the threshold uh, is taken to be a signal to noise rate of 10 uh, in the detector. Um, the, again, the, uh, that corresponds to Jansky scale uh, fluxes, which corresponds to something like 10 to the 38, 10 to the maybe 37 uh, ergs uh, if, the, uh, if the energy is released as a property, something like that. Not lower than that, definitely. But of order 10 to the 39, 10 to the 38 hertz, if that's the question, if I understand the question correctly. Okay. Um, and the last one that we can take now, since we're getting late, uh, from Piyush Bhattacharji is, can there be lensing of uh, GRBs by primordial black holes? Good question. <laughs> so after we put out the paper on fast radio bursts, we followed that up with a paper discussing uh, lensing, strong lensing of gamma ray bursts. The problem with gamma ray bursts is that, uh, there, well, there are two problems. One is that gamma ray bursts are not, uh, the intrinsic width is not a millisecond. They last, they can last for uh, up to two seconds, even longer. And so if they are lensed, you wouldn't see uh, two separate gamma ray bursts. You would see an overlaid image of two gamma ray bursts. So you need to do a sophisticated autocorrelation analysis to find um, to detect this lensing. The problem is that if you do an autocorrelation analysis and you want to find a deviation, a time delay, a time difference of about a one millisecond, you have to have features in the light curve that are of the, of the order of uh, one millisecond uh, in size. Okay, otherwise you would have nothing to autocorrelate in order to detect a one millisecond difference. And the minimum variability time scale of a gamma ray burst tends uh, not to be that small uh, in a lot of gamma ray bursts. So uh, doing this with gamma ray bursts is, is pretty hard. Uh, we were optimistic at first when we, when we thought about this and we you know, wrote the algorithm to actually do the search and we, we took swift data, of, you know, thousands of gamma ray bursts and analyzed them. Uh, but then we realized that, that uh, we might not be able, the, the data just not, might, not be, uh, might not allow us to, uh, to, to, to place this constraint. Um, but perhaps future data will. Okay, thanks. I think we'll end here now. Uh, there are a few more questions. We'll be forwarding all of these questions to Eli uh, in a bit. And um, Eli will then you know, answer them and we'll share the answers with everyone uh, in a day or so. Um, so I've now unmuted all of you. Um, if you could also unmute your own mics. And can we just give Eli uh, a vote of thanks and big hand for both his lectures? Very, very nice, good lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eli.